Good day everybody, Greg Satilla here from CRPGLegends.com and today we are going to be talking about The Outer Worlds. Now The Outer Worlds was a game that had a lot of expectations when it was announced. Obsidian Entertainment had made a lot of great games over the years using different licenses. They made Knights of the Old Republic 2, Fallout New Vegas, South Park Stick of Truth, and with The Outer Worlds, it was a game that looked very similar to their work in Fallout New Vegas, except it was set in a whole new world. A lot of people were expecting Fallout in space, although that is not exactly what we received. We did, in the end, get a lovely role-playing experience in a strange and interesting new setting with a colorful cast of characters. The Outer Worlds begins with you being defrosted from your transport ship after years of hibernation only to find out that your ship was adrift in space and all of the colonists being sent to the new Halcyon colony were still frozen in cryosleep. The doctor who unfroze you, a Dr. Phineas Wells, needs your help to unthaw the rest of the colonists. He believes that the Halcyon colony is being run to the ground by the board, an incompetent conglomerate of companies that run the settlements under a hyper-corporate philosophy. You soon stumble into the inheritance of your own ship, the Unreliable, and before long you have a diverse and interesting crew along for the ride with you. The hyper-corporate society is framed in a pretty compelling way, as your first encounter with civilization is in the community of Edgewater a community owned and operated by the company Spacer's Choice. If it's not the best, it's Spacer's Choice. As we explore, we learn a lot about how life operates in these colonies as we go through documents and dialogue. Employees are encouraged to schedule their sick leave four to six weeks in advance and have to repay that lost time. Their grave sites are rented from the company and an employee was charged with damaging company property after committing suicide and their closest living relative had to pay the fine. And by closest living relative, they meant the person relatively closest physically to the deceased when it happened. Edgewater relies on its Saltuna cannery for its survival, and we soon find out it's struggling. It's not even putting real Saltuna in the cans anymore. It's putting pretty much whatever they can find in there. Such are the stories all around Halcyon as you travel, and learn more of its inhabitants, you find that there is such an insane wealth gap between the poor and the rich, and getting into the wealthy city of Byzantium is a pipe dream for the majority of the people. As you explore Halcyon, you come into contact with different factions. The board itself, who is trying to preserve their control on the colony and is searching for any information they can on their number one enemy, the mad scientist Dr. Phineas Wells, and constantly ask for any information that can lead to his arrest. You have the independent ship, the Groundbreaker, which is a spaceport run by a family of engineers where the majority of the trading is done on the colony. The planet Monarch, which has been exiled by the board due to the fear of violence after an uprising, has been split into multiple factions vying for control and an independent company known as Sublight Salvage and Shipping, which is run by a very unique individual who has some really unique thoughts on what the board is actually up to. These factions are all pretty unique, and you're free to manage your relationships with them how you please for the most part. You can play through this game as a board sympathizer and use all your power to consolidate their power, or you can fight against their oppressive measures to free the indentured population, or you can remain as neutral as possible as you try to get to the bottom of what is happening in Halcyon. Who are you in all of this? Well, you're the stranger revived from cryosleep with some enhanced abilities that you have gained, such as the ability to slow down time. Your character isn't tethered to some predetermined character templates. You're pretty free to determine how your character will play out. The game begins by letting you assign your attributes, which are divided into three categories, body, mind, and personality. Body has strength and dexterity, mind governs intelligence and perception, and personality has charm and temperament. These initial abilities all start at average and you have 6 points to play with, although you can take points away from some of those average abilities to shore up something else. These attributes govern your skills and the rest of the game you will be putting points in those skills, which can be boosted or lowered depending on the armor you are wearing or the party members that you bring along with you. Character creation systems like this are among my favorite. You don't get slotted into some predetermined class, you can really make some strange creatures. 
While my first playthrough focused on long guns and lock picking and hacking, my second character has been focused on two hand melee weapons, leadership skills and persuasion. It is fun to play around with the possibilities of character creation. The pacing of the game starts slow and lets you come to grips with the world and its surroundings before really bringing it full circle as it ramps up towards the end. You don't really feel a sense of urgency in this game until the third act. The first part of the game is really learning about the world and its inhabitants. This is very different from another grand space adventure RPG, Mass Effect, which thrusts you in the middle of an interplanetary intrigue and the destruction of the galaxy right from the get-go. People might like the slow burn as you get to know a little more and more about the world as it unfolds in front of you, but I would have preferred a little more urgency to get into the story. But it's a minor concern because I did thoroughly enjoy my time in Halcyon. The actual gameplay of the game is played in first person and the game is mostly a mix of combat and dialogue options. The combat plays very well, it is responsive and snappy, there is a time slowdown element that can be used to take advantage of enemies and give you some freedom to position yourself while everyone is moving real real slow, but some of the RPG elements can hurt the gunplay. Based on your level and the zone you're in, you can go from one bullet being able to take out a marauder on Edgewater to needing an almost a full clip of shots to take out a marauder on another planet later in the story. The weapons themselves have a wide variety, and weapons and armor can be upgraded as you play through the game, although I found that as I leveled up, I needed to keep my guns upgraded for maximum impact, but my armor, on the other hand, was usually worn based on what skills it helped me with, not necessarily on whether it protected me more or not. However, I did play on the default difficulty. Armor and consumables probably play a bigger role on the more advanced difficulty settings, although I wish I would have needed them more on normal. In general though, combat is fun and satisfying. One interesting part that the game includes is occasionally you will be presented with an option to choose a flaw for your character in exchange for a perk point. These flaws aren't horrible, they might be something like your character is flawed against a certain type of damage, so you will take an extra 25% damage from that damage source for the rest of the game. But you gain another perk point, which are usually only given out once every two levels. This might be more enticing if the perks were a little better, but I never really felt it was necessary to take a flaw in order to get an additional perk point, although I did choose to take a flaw once, just to do it. I don't know if it really paid off. You could use it to acquire other tiers of perks earlier in the game, although I found that even after I had access to tier 2 perks, they were still choosing tier 1 perks. Although the same can't be said for tier 3, which does give you access to some pretty powerful perks. The side quests for the most part are relatively short and simple. There is a lot of fetch quests that are simplified with the games of fast travel ability and this is nice because a lot of the time you are simply returning to areas where there would be no combat or that you have already cleared out. The real purpose of these side quests tends to be for world building which I think this game does a great job of. You get to see how this world operates, the plight of the workers, the excuses of the board, the personalities of those struggling to make a living just to survive. It's a world I honestly want to see more of. When you go to your navigation screen, you see all these interesting planets. I was very interested in exploring Hephaestus, a planet that shares a name with another planet from Anachronox, named after the Greek god of fire and blacksmiths. Unfortunately, this planet was never unlocked along with a few of the other planets. There's hope we might get to see more of these worlds in DLC, but I'm not going to hold my breath as DLC has been few and far between so far. Let's just say that I was disappointed that all of the planets that were displayed on the map were not available and don't look like they will be available anytime soon. Maybe a bit of a paradox, but I always find that these space games with multiple planets and locales always seem a lot smaller than one big open world. In one open world you are left free to wander and explore a massive map, whereas in these space games, each planet or locale is generally quite small in comparison leaving you little room for exploration in each zone in comparison, and ends up feeling a lot smaller and more constrained overall. The upside is that Halcyon is at least very interesting and full of little adventures both funny and dark, and the game can get quite dark. On one space station you find the journals of a man haunted by paranoia and mental illness as he hears voices that have people pleading for him to end their suffering by killing them and spilling their blood. 
Another has you dealing with a suspicious disappearance surrounding a seemingly normal family. On the flip side of the coin, some quests have you shopping for fancy soap and posh outfits for an important date, so there is a lot of variety to keep you interested. Even though the playable zones on the planet can be quite small for the most part, they are pretty dense with lore and world building. You end up spending quite a bit of time on Monarch, and it is a surprisingly dense planet that really gives you a lot of information on the history of the colony and the motivations of its key players. Throughout the game, your crew can be joined by up to 6 companions, and some of them are very interesting indeed. The standouts for me were definitely the awkward, self-conscious engineer Parvati that struggles with her attraction to the captain and engineer of the groundbreaker Junlei Tennyson. The second was the Dr. Ellie, whose story revolves around her distrust of people and her inability to see why people would care for one another, which gets some development when you do her companion quest on Byzantium. All of the companions in the game, outside of the cleaning robot Sam, have colorful personalities and their stories are revealed through chatting with them and doing their individual companion quests, and also through their interactions with other party members. It really helps to make them a believable crew. Unfortunately, outside of the boosts they give your skills, they aren't overly helpful in combat, although they do have their own unique special abilities that can turn the tide on some of the battles and could be more useful with players that don't focus on their own combat abilities. It is very important that your ship is really cool in a space RPG. Knights of the Old Republic had the Ebon Hawk, and Mass Effect gave us the Normandy, and the Outer Worlds gives us the Unreliable and her unique ship AI, Ada, who although denies being autonomous and having emotion, really demonstrates a real love for her former Captain Hawthorne, who is now deceased. Even without Ada, the Unreliable is a really cool spaceship, but Ada's lovely personality helps in making the Unreliable that much more enjoyable. I do want to touch upon Pravarti again, as you really do form a bond with her as she is the first companion that you will probably come across as you play. She is funny and insecure and has this realistic charm to her as she doesn't quite know how to pursue her infatuation with Jun Lei. And it really is quite fun to help her through her questions and concern. The game really treats this relationship really well. It's a very kind and touching and a very human story and it's nice to see a plot line a little bit more subdued in a story full of such extreme events. The game does a good job of humanizing a good portion of the people you deal with. One cool part of the game is that as you play the story you will collect souvenirs which will get displayed in your captain's quarters on the ship which is fun to stop by and look around as you play through the game. It's a small little feature that makes your ship feel like home. I did find the game rather short. I hit max level and finished the game in 20 hours, which is some quality time to get out of a AAA studio first person game and I understand that a lot of people don't finish games that are too long even if they are great. I just assumed the game would be longer based on my time in Fallout New Vegas where there was so much to do and explore outside of the main story. I will say my 20 hours in the world were well polished and cohesive and that maybe if the game was bigger I would have fretted there was too much to do and I might have got tired of it before the end. It's a tough line in the sand to draw. That being said, I wanted to spend more time in this world. I wanted to explore more planets. I wanted to see how the rest of the colony was doing and more of its history. Overall though, I was satisfied with the ending I received on my playthrough. I think it left the game world open for another story while also putting a nice bow on the story of you and your crew. That being said, I would love to return to either my character and crew for another adventure, but I would also be happy to play a new person and meet new people within this world. Obsidian Entertainment is a very capable studio, and after their acquisition by Microsoft has made me more confident on them producing quality content as Microsoft seems to really be going all in on gaming, acquiring some huge studios over the past few years, including recently Bethesda, which has people frothing at the mouth for a new Obsidian made Fallout game. I, however, would be completely satisfied with Obsidian continuing working on the Outer Worlds, as this first game was really good, but I think there is a lot of room for some real satisfying growth here. 
Overall, I would classify Outer Worlds as a very good game. The story was fun and engaging, the gameplay was satisfying enough, and I really enjoyed the party members. I also have an urge to get back in the game with a fresh character on a higher difficulty setting and do some more playing. This alone generally tells me whether I've enjoyed playing a game or not, whether I want to move on to the next game, or whether I want to jump back in for another go. And with The Outer Worlds, I definitely want to jump back in for another go. Thanks everyone again for listening. I really did enjoy The Outer Worlds. I really enjoyed making this video and all my other videos. You can check out below the links that I have for my website, my stream, my Patreon account, my Twitter page, and please like and subscribe to my YouTube page if you like these videos. It really does help me out. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'll see you next time.